SJC 11882, Tony Marie Galvin v. Stephanie DePelto, and SJC 11892, Leanne Blowen v. Chief Justice of the Probate and Family Court. Attorney Finnegan. Good morning. May it please the court, Attorney Susan Finnegan, with my colleagues Jeff Friedman and Sandra Baden, representing the appellant mother in this guardianship matter. Uh, this matter appeal arises out of a <coughs> reservation and report out of the Hamden County Probate and Family Court, and the court poses a limited question as to whether the right to counsel of indigent parents in guardianship proceedings extends to parents' petitions for removal under GL 190B, Section 5212. The appellant mother in this case, as well as the, as the appellant mothers in the joint case, assert um, that the answer to that question should be yes. And even the probate and family court, the appellee in the paired case, concede that the answer to that question is yes. Um, there are at least three reasons why this court uh, should hold that there is a right to counsel for indigent parents. Uh, in petitions to remove. First of all, the court in guardianship of VV established the right for indigent parents in guardianship proceedings um, to have a right to counsel. And the court looked no further than the, than the language um, and the holding in VV um, to uh, uh, agree that the right to counsel should extend in this matter. Um, second, even if the court decision, even if the VV decision is interpreted, limit, interpreted in a limited matter, and that it only applies to petitions for guardianship. Um, this court, um, the reasoning of VV um, should um, compel the conclusion that the right to counsel should extend to petitions to remove. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Could you explain, is it different in the probate and family court than it is in the juvenile court? Is the juvenile court doing this differently? And if so, how is it the juvenile court is doing that? Um, it's a bit unclear, to be quite honest. There is um, a, a right for a guardianship to arise in a juvenile court proceeding, uh, concurrently typically with a care and protection proceeding in juvenile court. Um, and um, typically there is an appointment of counsel throughout that guardianship proceeding. Um, at times when the so, guardian- So it's DCF seeking the guardianship? Um, the, uh, yes, the DCF is seeking guardianship in that, in that particular context. Do, do you know the statutory authority for the juvenile court guardianship proceedings? Pardon me? The, what, what is the statutory basis for the guardianship proceeding in the juvenile court? It may be under the care and protection statute. It's under the care and protection okay. statute, okay. yes. And so, so it's never going to be a private, a purely private situation as these are. That's that true. Are However, from what I understand anecdotally, um, at times when the care and protection is over, um, the court in juvenile court will still reappoint counsel if the guardianship continues in that context. Well, if there were the situations that were to have arisen in juvenile court that arose here, that is to say, um, mothers seeking to remove the guardians, um, and they were indigent, and they came to the juvenile court, the mm -hmm. juvenile court would appoint counsel for the mothers in those situations. Yes, and, and I, I suppose, although I'm not exactly sure because even the, the folks that are on the ground in juvenile court um, haven't necessarily come to a, a firm conclusion, but from what I understand, juvenile court, um, uh, even when the care and protection is over, would appoint counsel, and one could conclude perhaps that perhaps they're looking to the guardianship statute in the private context if this care and protection proceedings is over. Um, if you, while we're interrupting, uh, if, Assume that you're correct, that, that VV, that we read VV as applying to removal proceedings. Where, where do you, two questions. One, is it just removal proceedings or any kind of proceeding in which uh, um, a parent is seeking to do something vis-a-vis -vis the guardianship that's already in place? This particular case, that's a, the issue is only with respect to removal. However, I know. Um, in the paired case, um, uh, there are some other aspects of the, of the re, of, of uh, this particular statute, which is broad. And the statute governs both resignations of guardianship, it, it uh, also applies to removals of guardianship, and it also has a very broad third category of any other um, petition <coughs> that may be in the best interest of the child. Um, and so with respect to this case, the court could rule very narrowly um, that the right to counsel could apply in this petition for removal context. However, um, 
as the briefs demonstrate, they, they do, it does implicate a lot of other um, aspects, such as visitation um, and um, resignations and other aspects. As you, as you envision it, is there a limit in, on how many times this can happen? For example, can a parent every three months say, I want to remove the guardian, mm -hmm. not for any particular reason, but just because I want to and get um, counsel? And Interestingly, in the in the um, in this under the statute, there are no uh, limitations um, uh, that are implicated in the statute. Unlike care and protection, where there are limits t in terms of time limits and other. Um, interestingly, if you if the if you look at the actual numbers, um, even before right to counsel, the numbers are rather relatively low. You mean, you um, mean the number of the private number guardianships? Is that what you mean? The number of the number of guardianships is relatively low, between four and five thousand. Um, and I would refer the court to the addendum both in the um, Mass Law Reform uh, amicus brief as well as the CPCS amicus brief. In the addendum, they cite the actual numbers of cases. And with respect Probate and Family Court or all? Excuse me? In which court? Oh, Sorry. in Probate and Family Court. Thank you. Yes. And then if you look at the actual petitions to remove, um, I believe that the numbers are something like 467 in 2014 and 550 perhaps, something like that in last year. So the numbers are very low. Um, and so even while se some of the, the um, litigants are self-represented, it doesn't seem to be a problem based on the numbers. However, um, if um, counsel were appointed, um, uh, one could envision that that, uh, that number actually could go down. Um, in or that, it could go up. Or it could go up. Um, and they will come. Um, well, uh, the other aspect is that under VV, there is um, a right to counsel at the initial stage. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at the facts at our case, in our case, our client, came, a mother came forward. She thought that she was um, agreeing to a temporary guardianship. But in fact, what was happening was a, a permanent guardianship. So if she had counsel initially, um, she would have better understood what she was agreeing to. And one could conceive that perhaps there would be no need for a petition for removal down the road. So that was going to my next question is what what um, is there any kind of showing that you think needs to be uh, made on removal? But I, I guess even I mean, what do you do about a consent situation? If if I can go back to VV in that way, it, it, it wouldn't matter. I take it you would say at least at least she would be entitled to counsel even if she thinks she's going to consent to this guardianship because that's how you would read VV. But take the removal. Is there any, any kind of showing that needs to be made by the mother mm -hmm. uh, before counsel is appointed? Um, in the um, probate and family court's brief, there is a suggestion um, that a burden of production um, come forward. However, that burden of production that is advocated by the probate and court is, um, is, is incorrect in that it is... Um, saying that the burden of production is for entitlement to counsel rather than a merit showing, which I think that is what you're asking. Um, and so if the court does impose some kind of burden of production, which the care and protection of Aaron case in the um, care and protection context has, has stated is, is the way that, that, should, be, that should be followed, um, would like to note two things. One is that the, care, the burden of production that is advocated by the probate court is much higher than is found in, in the Aaron case. The burden of, of production um, that's advocated by the probate and family court indicates that, that you have to show circumstances have materially and significantly changed, whereas Aaron just suggests that you must present some credible evidence. And further, if the court does impose a burden of production, um, it should note that the care and protection statute um, is very detailed, and the, um, the statute here at issue um, Chapter 190B, Section 5212 is very broad, as I mentioned before. And if a burden of production is uh, imposed, uh, the court needs to be mindful of that and, and, not, and, and, notice, and, and note that um, a one-size-fits-all burden of production may not work if it's linked to that particular statute. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. May it please the court, Laura Gall, along with Tina Par Paradiso, on behalf of plaintiffs Leanne Bluen and Corinne Lentes, both of whom are mothers with children under guardianship who have requested and been denied court-appointed <coughs> counsel in post-decree guardianship proceedings. Plaintiffs challenge the probate and family court's current policy of limiting 
appointment of counsel and post decree guardianship proceedings. So let me ask the same question uh, or two. What uh, are there any limits as to <coughs> what kinds of challenges should be um, uh, should entitle a, a mother to counsel and two any kind of showing with respect to the merits of the I mean what about change circumstances or not or how do you how do you trigger the appointment the the appointment would be triggered by the filing of a petition to either modify or to remove <clears throat> and and it doesn't it doesn't matter a what the from your view it doesn't matter what the modification might be and it doesn't matter whether there's any kind of colorable showing of I don't know what, but ju just the filing of the petition per se triggers the right to counsel, that's what you would say? Yes, that that should ought to be the trigger. Whether or not every <coughs> issue warrants appointment of counsel is a reasonable question to, to ask, and I think as is raised in the amicus brief by CPCS, there may be issues such as child support that are not appropriate because they do not um, get at the issue of whether or not there is an ongoing need for the guardianship and whether or not it is in the best interest of the child to continue the guardianship as defined. Modifications on issues of visitation or on issues of the parent's role in the child's life with respect to decisions on educational and medical decisions do implicate that parent's future ability to regain custody of the child and therefore would be appropriate for appointment <coughs> of counsel. Is any limits? I mean, in other words, if, would, would you, I, I, I'm purposely exaggerating, but would you be able to come in every month because you thought that the guardian should be taking the child to an orthodontist? Or I, right. The, the statute does not prevent this revolving door that um, is of concern. However, as um, my sister attorney pointed out, that the statistics do not reflect that problem. If that problem were to arise, uh, this court said in the guardianship of VV case that a, a appointment of counsel <coughs> must be in the same manner as for parents whose children are under care and protection. Those parents receive an opportunity to present their case to the court at least once every six months. And as part of the the, the merits of the case, they do have a burden of production for which they have the assistance of counsel in presenting. And it may be appropriate to adopt a similar burden of production if it is broad enough to encompass modifications to increase parenting time or the parent's role in the child's life during the pregnancy. And, and some, you, I mean, maybe you would or wouldn't agree that some, I, I take it would be by rule, but some setting of a schedule, in other words, adopting by rule um, you know, every six months or whatever the <coughs> unit of time might be, but in other words, adopting a unit of time in which uh, uh, that would define when a parent could, could trigger this. That has been successful in the context of care and protection. By statute, though, so that's what I'm, yeah. Right. What this court has found is that in order to balance the, the due process rights of parents and the um, the reasonable costs and expenses that concern the Commonwealth, that a once every six months limit has been sufficient. And it may well be sufficient in guardianships also. Unfortunately, we don't have the practice to know that at this time. Now let me ask you about the CMP two questions. One is that the every six month period is when the parent seeks it. But every year, the parent automatically gets it, doesn't it? Yes, there is a very important additional safeguard in the care and protection proceeding, and that is the annual review that is initiated by the court in which contains a requirement that the court certify that there have been reasonable efforts made toward <coughs> reunification of the parent and child. The guardianship proceeding contains neither safeguards. Doesn't there have to be a report every year, though? There has to be, yes, there has to be a report pursuant to Section 5209. However, that is a report submitted by the guardians who may have very personal interest in the case and does not trigger any automatic action by the court, nor does it anticipate any participation by the parent. Can you get to the result you want by statutory interpretation, or do we have to go the constitutional route to get due process to get to where you want to be? There is at this time no statutory basis for uh, appointment of counsel for indigent parents in guardianship proceedings unless um, 
it is a family that is otherwise involved, where the child is also under care and protection. Going back to Your Honor's uh, question earlier about guardianships that are initiated when there is already an existing care and protection. Uh, there can be an open care and protection proceeding in the juvenile court, and private parties can go to the uh, probate and family court and initiate a guardianship. It is clear under the statute that the parents, if economically eligible in that case, would be appointed counsel at least for the initial proceeding in that <coughs> probate and family case. And then by case law, the case of uh, care and protection of, or regarding Thomasina, it states that that right to counsel in the probate and family court guardianship proceeding continues for as long as the care and protection remains open. And that care and protection would remain open under those circumstances until the child reached the age of majority. Can I also just ask a question? I know it's not quite before us, but in those situations, <coughs> whether we're talking in um, the, well, let's the one that you were just suggesting, the one in um, the juvenile court. In juvenile court. Yeah. Um, <coughs> in those circumstances, when the um, <coughs> court appoints counsel for the indigent parent, uh, does the court <coughs> also appoint counsel for the child? Yes, in a care and protection proceeding, the, the children are also appointed counsel. Is your question whether or not the child receives counsel for the probate and family court? Well, I guess the first question is in connection with the guardianship that may arise out of the care and protection proceeding in juvenile court. When counsel is appointed for the parent, is counsel also appointed for the child? The Thomasina, I believe, does not address the issue of appointment of counsel for children extending beyond the care and protection. It may well be the practice, however, that because there would already be counsel appointed for the child in the context of the care and protection, that that child's attorney would extend his or her services to the probate and family court action. Which would be the follow-up to, um, to the CNP. Right. Or, yes. it, or going parallel. I it think. could run parallel. A care and protection seeks uh, to have a permanent plan for the child, and the permanent plan can be guardianship. So the, does that answer your question? It, it, yes. In the guardianship proceeding, is, is, the reason, um, is the reason that counsel who was appointed for the initial proceeding not carried through because the uh, uh, the removal proceeding is a separate case? It's a separate docket number? It is not a separate docket number. The reason that it is not carried through is because the probate and family courts have narrowly and in violation of due process interpreted this court's decision in guardianship of VV. It could very well carry through. So as a practical matter, um, is who gets appointed uh, if we do say that there is a right to counsel, would it be the same lawyer that was appointed for the initial proceeding, or is it a new lawyer who has to re-educate himself or herself as to what happened before? Ideally, and in most cases, it would be the same <coughs> attorney, uh, just as the practice is anecdotally in the, the, the juvenile court that the same, fam the same attorney would return for the very reasons that you've raised. That would be true in the probate and family court, and it would only be in those instances where that attorney were not available that there would be a need for a new attorney to educate herself on the case and step in. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Nora Kane and I represent the Appellant B children. They are ages 17, seven, and five and a half. Of the three cases before this court, they were the only children who did not have trial counsel. The B children are part of the only <coughs> remaining class of children in similarly situated cases that do not have an absolute right to counsel in contested matters. Ms. Cain, would you agree, however, that um, that issue, uh, while obviously a very important issue, but it, it hasn't been raised in either of the case directly, right? I, I know you've briefed it, but it wasn't raised, it certainly isn't raised in the, in the um, guardianship uh, reported from the probate court. And with respect to the one that was reserved and reported, 
it isn't raised there either, right? Yes, Your Honor. It was not raised below, but my argument is, is that the impossibility of this issue being raised below is exactly what makes it an exceptional circumstance which justifies this court's review. If you look at the statute, there are three ways in which counsel can be appointed for children in probate guardianship matters. First, if the child asks, the court shall appoint. If someone asks on the child's behalf, the court shall appoint. If the court determines that the child is being inadequately represented, the court shall appoint. As you've seen in this case, two of the children did receive counsel. They would never need to preserve or appeal the issue. They have counsel. It's only children like the B children, the, the ones who slip through the cracks, the ones who want the benefit of counsel but don't know how to ask, <coughs> the ones who don't have anyone who knows how to or wants to ask on their behalf, and the ones that do not have a judge that recognizes their need. Well, typically, who asks on behalf of a child, uh, say a four-year-old child who doesn't know how to petition for himself or herself? It might possibly be a parent or it might possibly be the guardian. The, the problem is, is that the parent or the guardian might have competing interests, which might prevent a parent or guardian for asking on the child's behalf. And my argument is, is that the due process rights for children in these contested matters are exactly the same as the due process rights for children in similarly situated cases, and that it shouldn't be reliant on their ability to ask or someone with possibly competing interests asking on their behalf. What are the similarly situated situations? Um, the similarly situated situations are care and protection matters, termination matters, CRA matters, um, guardianship cases in which the department is a party. In all of those cases, a child is possibly being removed from a family home. And in all of those cases, children are automatically appointed counsel? By statute. By yes. Statute. They're automatically um, appointed, including those on whose behalf it never is requested? All of, the, all of those cases I mentioned are by statute except the Megan case, which gives counsel to children in private um, adoption termination cases. Do, does the record reflect whether uh, DCF was involved in this case before the guardianship had been filed? I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor. The, I know that the department was not a party in the case. If the department was a party in the case, the children and the parents would have all automatically received counsel. Well, because it would have been a CNP? No, because under statute, any time the department is a party in a guardianship matter, the children have to have the children and the parents have a right to counsel. Which could you do? You know the statute? Um, <coughs> so um, I believe it's one nineteen section twenty nine, and uh, I think um, twenty nine B and twenty three. And I believe the case of Babylonie versus Babylonie also addresses um, when it's in the probate court. Okay. Is, there any, is there anything in the record that reflects whether DCF um, is a result of some earlier involvement in a case may suggest to a prospective guardian that they should go up and apply for guardianship? There's, uh, to my knowledge, not in this case, but that, um, as I cited in my brief, there are circumstances when that happens um, where the department is involved either by suggesting to a guardian to go or by appearing on a guardian's behalf, um, and that was discussed to um, show state in involvement that maybe isn't as direct as when they're a party, but behind the scenes. So let me, how, how, how broad a right is this? I mean, are you looking for the appointment of counsel for children in every initial guardianship proceeding or in every post-guardianship litigation? Uh, what, what? I'm asking for the appointment of counsel in any contested matter, be it the initial petition or any later um, petition. Well, why only move? contested? Well, I mean, in I'm, other words, what, I mean, yeah, why? Because right. the child's interests may be different than... Um, my request in the brief was based on the precedent in Megan, Holly, and Vivi, which do only talk about contested matters. I know that there's a pilot program in Hampshire County in the probate court, which is discussing the appointment of counsel in, for children in all cases, contested or not. I certainly have no objection to the appointment of counsel for children in all cases. My concern was that in contested cases, it raises a heightened level of concerns for the children. Um, in closing, I'd just like to address um, GL's argument regarding the fact that um, 
parents um, should only have a right to counsel in the initial petition. Um, I think that argument is motivated by the child's desire to stay um, with, the with the guardian and not return with the mother. Um, and I think this argument is misguided because the true issue for GL, like the children, for, like the B children, is that children really need attorneys to make sure that their positions are advocated for. And that right can coexist and need not trump parents' right to counsel as it doesn't in similarly situated care and protection, termination matters, and um, private, private adoptions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Your Honors. Joanne Shotwell Kaplan for the Appellee Probate and Family Court Justices. There is, as you've heard, substantial agreement among the parties in Amiki at this point with respect to an indigent parent's right to counsel when she files a petition to remove a guardian and regain counsel. The question well, that well, I'm not even with that. You seem to be saying she has to make an initial showing that the merits are somewhat something in order to get counsel, which seems to me completely. Uh, counterproductive because well, I don't know how she's supposed to do that. The, the question is when the right to counsel arise. You're right, that is the dispute. The question is when. When is there a new deprivation? Given that we're talking about someone who has already had full due process at the initial appointment stage, including now under VV, the right to counsel, does that individual um, have a protected liberty interest each and every day thereafter, regardless of whether anything has changed since that prior process occurred, that means that individual, by filing a piece of paper and nothing more, can trigger a right to counsel uh, in a, attain a new full adjudication, a whole nother process. We well, say, but why doesn't the, the why doesn't uh, uh, counsel the appearance of counsel remain until the guardianship is closed? W w why just because an initial guardian has been appointed does that terminate the right to guardianship? At well, least in counsel. your view, you mean the it right to counsel? The right, right to counsel. It terminates the proceeding entirely. Um, CPCS makes this point in their brief. That is a distinction between the private guardianship process and the care and protection process. There is no ongoing proceeding. There is no ongoing state involvement with the child and the family. And there are very real distinctions that result from that, including, for instance, some protections for parents in the care and protection uh, pr uh, process to try and offset the harm that could potentially result to family integrity from the ongoing involvement of DCF. You don't have that in the private context. And so the guardian is appointed, the proceeding is over. CPCS agrees with us that the counsel who was appointed for that proceeding is no longer representing the party. So it's, when a removal petition is filed, it does not get a new docket number. Or it does get a new it docket number. It does get a new docket number. I don't know whether it actually gets a new docket number in the juvenile court, but there have been some misstatements here about how it works in the juvenile court. By statute in juvenile court, counsel is not appointed for the parent in a guardianship removal or um, modification proceeding unless DCF is a party, and it typically is not uh, if there, the dispute is with the private guardian. Once the guardian has been appointed, DCF very often is not a party to the very kinds of proceedings that do occur in juvenile court, and they occur under the same probate court, can, can, uh, the, the probate code um, terms that we're talking about for probate court. They're can, not governed by the care and protection. I, I just want to see uh, if I can yeah. understand what, what you're advocating for. So you say, the parent, uh, there's been a guardianship created in probate and family court, let's just say with consent, I mean, as this case, with consent, mm -hmm. or one of them. Um, and then it's eight months later and things have changed, and, or, or they haven't changed. Uh, it's eight months later, or it's questionable whether they've changed. And the mother comes forward and um, seeks to get her children back. And you say she's got to, you say she's got to come on her own, and it's going to be discretionary with the probate and family judge whether a uh, she gets counsel, and then b whether you can go forward. I 
We do, Your Honor, because Aaron tells us in the care and protection yes, context. Yes, but that's a statute. Okay. Aaron tells us that there's no new deprivation of but, a right. But unless that person has counsel when she is making that argument. By statute, she does. Yes. But there are certainly many circumstances in which unrepresented litigants must make upfront showings of a meritorious issue before counsel is appointed by discretion. That's the criminal new trial context. Uh, new trial motion. That's the Kanchikeho case that we um, cite and discuss. Yes, but in I don't brief. think you've got a. Con I mean, I don't think there's a constitutional, uh, or it may get implicated. But it just seems different. Isn't oh, it's it? a due process decision, Your Honor, and it, it it involves physical liberty. So, if anything, perhaps it's a higher um, liberty interest. And oh. the rule in Kanchikeho, which has been the law since 1983, and nobody's suggesting it hasn't worked appropriately, is that there is no absolute right to appoint. That person of has had a trial, has had a right to um, uh, to appeal that trial, and. That's all, existed. Very That's all existed here as well, Your Honor. Well, no. There has been no. this appointment no. proceeding. Because in the criminal context, there's been a conviction, perhaps an appeal. It, a, a final judgment has entered, and sentence is being served. Here, uh, it, it, there's an ongoing relationship that still exists between the parent and the child that the parent is, is seeking to... To, to, to modify. Well, that's true, but there has been a final judgment. Name, if it's not but, but the interests to, of the, But the interests of the parent are much different and much stronger. Well, they're much different than those of somebody who's been convicted of a crime and, and had an appeal. Well, the parent has been found unfit. Let's take that example. That's not necessarily that, so if it's, I know been it's, a not necessarily if it's a consent so. I know it's not necessarily so, but let's take that example because that's a subset of what we're talking about. There has been a full adjudication of fitness, and the parent has been well, found example, unfit. Why don't we take another example? Because I think that's the one that's most helpful to your argument. Why don't we take one that's not so helpful to your argument? Well, all of that process was, afford was available to the individual who will now be represented by counsel, given your VV decision, at that upfront appointment stage, and will make a decision with the benefit of counsel whether to invoke the right to that full process. But all of that process is available. Can, can and perhaps DCF is in the wings, and perhaps that's why they consent. That's <clears throat> true in a great many instances, I'm advised. back to juvenile court. Now, you're saying that juvenile, I see, I had been under the impression that it was as a result of an order issued by the Chief Justice of the Probate and Family Court, that um, the probate court was handling this differently than was going on in juvenile court, which is one of the things that prompted my question in the first instance. So post, yes, post VV, that's accurate. Okay, so if in the situation that we were discussing, where um, guardianship is the desirable result and DCF backs out, and DCF is no longer in, involved, you're saying that the that the probate and family courts approach and the juvenile courts approach are the same at that point. I'm saying post VV, it's not the same. What um, is it going but on? But pre VV, in, it was. No, I want to know what's going on post VV. What is what is the juvenile court doing? Is it appointing counsel for the parent? who wants to, who files a removal petition? It is because of an interpretation of VV. Okay, so that's the practice that I was after. Mm -hmm. in, and that's what's happening in, pro in, in juvenile court now. The, that's correct. Uh, uh, counsel are being appointed for the parents in these situations where they are not being appointed right. in probate and family court. But we don't believe, and we're now presenting a unified position of the trial court to you. We do not believe that VV is properly read as resolving the issues before you. We think there is uh, a very real distinction once you get post-appointment. But this is not, I, I understand that, but I'm saying that when it's going on in, in juvenile court, the sky has not fallen. Well, we have very limited experience um, with this post-VV. That's only a February decision. And certainly by statute, there is no entitlement to counsel. So obviously the legislature disagrees with the notion that they must have the benefit of counsel in these That's, kinds of proceedings. I wouldn't go there. I mean, we don't know what the legislature thinks, do we? Well, they've made this distinction saying, and there are many distinctions of this nature in the the differences between the care and protection context and the private guardian context, which is there are special protections that are needed when someone is up against the resources of the state. The, 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 the statute, however, precedes our decision in VV, does it not? It does. Right, so it doesn't tell us anything about what the, stat, what the legislature thinks in connection with VV. Well, VV doesn't resolve the post-appointment questions. Those are the questions that are now before us. And their position would literally have you give 
parents the ability, armed with counsel, to challenge the existence of guardianships and every decision the guardian makes in their custodial discretion. Every single day the guardianship is in place without regard to whether anything has changed since a prior proceeding in which they were afforded or at least had available to them full due process protections. What that is do? not the way the court has dealt with it in the care and protection context where the party is up against the resources of the state. But, but in, in, in the care and protection context, uh, does the parent with counsel have the opportunity to challenge every decision made by CNP, by um, the DCF? No, Your Honor, because by statute, uh, they don't get the benefit of counsel if DCF is not a party to post-appointment proceedings. No, I'm talking about in, in care and protection cases. I'm talking about care, in care and protection cases. Chapter 119, Section uh, 29 limits the statutory right to counsel to when DCF is a party. So no, they do not have a statutory right to counsel uh, in post-appointment uh, modification proceedings, visitation proceedings, removal proceedings where DCF is not a party. Uh, we think that Aaron controls this question of when the right kicks in because it doesn't allow someone, even in the care and protection context, a parent, to trigger due process rights just by filing a sheet of paper saying, I want custody back. But, it but, says, it's, but Aaron is about a, it's statutory. B, it's not about right to counsel. Aaron's not statutory. Aaron, Aaron is constitutional. It's due process. It's talking. It's not talking about right to counsel. Oh, but it's in the context of a statutory, statutorily defined rights and procedures, right? Well, not not really. No, it's applying the um, constitutional due process analysis to burden and standard of proof. And it's saying there must isn't be an it, upfront showing of changed circumstances. I, I thought it was interpreting a statute when it does that. No, it's not. I mean, we have statutory frameworks in both contexts, but no, it's not interpreting a statute. It's a due process case, and it's saying the due process rights arise. appointment process has resolved nothing. I mean, literally the next day, by filing a sheet of paper, they would get armed with counsel to have another right but to adjudicate. But every year they get to do that, don't they? I'm sorry? Every year they get to do that in the care and protection context every, with the appointment of counsel. Every year in the care and protection context, there must be another review, right. and by statute, there is a right to counsel That's in that That's quite connection. different context in what, than, than a guardianship where there is no such automatic right of review with appointment of counsel. Right, but in the guardianship context, there's a greater right because they don't have to wait every six months to trigger a review. They can literally file a piece of paper the day after the guardian is appointed and every day thereafter and say, I want custody back. But that's also in the context of the statute where there are so far fewer procedural protections. There are so far fewer risks because the state is not involved in an ongoing way, I submit, Your Honor. That's the only context in which you have less procedural protection. There's absolutely no obligation on the part of the guardian to try to reunify the child with the parent, as there is in the context of the state involvement on the CNP side. That is so correct, for because all the, the risks, guardian doesn't have benefits, the same resources. For I'm all sorry? the risks, there are also benefits on the CNP side. There are risks and benefits on both sides, uh, but they are seeking greater right to counsel than exists in the care and protection context. They are seeking greater right to counsel than exists in the criminal new trial context. Well, well um, with respect to greater, I mean, do you think it's possible that the probate and family court could adopt rules that would define some of these time frames and still be within due process? Well, I think it's difficult for there to be some absolute limit placed on the number or frequency of filings where the statute does not yes, do right. that. Um, I think the proper control is the one that Aaron adopted, which is this upfront showing of changed circumstances. But how, as a practical matter, you come in and you, you've got to show changed circumstances, but the trigger is you want counsel, and you don't have counsel to be able to do that unless in the discretion of the judge you get it. 
Well, the, no, the trigger is that you want custody back, Your Honor. Well, I know yeah. that, but you, you, you want the person to come in to show that there is a colorable claim of changed circumstances, and maybe the judge could appoint counsel to help that person do that, but that's really in the discretion of the judge. At least that's how I read your brief. Yes, that's exactly correct, and that is the Conchiqueo scenario in what is arguably a context where a greater liberty interest is threatened. Uh, we're concerned about the impact of this unlimited ability to trigger a right to counsel and go after the guardian on every issue under the sun um, without any kind of upfront showing that anything has changed on people's willingness to serve as guardians. Um, you've heard about other suggestions about consequences. That's a very real one. Why is anyone going to agree to be a guardian how, if how high every is this day they should be challenged for this way? Change circumstances. I mean, how do how does that work as a practical matter? Showing change circumstances. Well, all all the individual has to do uh, they have to do it now when they file the petition. It seeks to elicit evidence of changed circumstances, and we we talked in our brief about various ways in which the court could adopt some new processes that would design to be helpful in that regard. And we have said that a judge, in his or her discretion, should be able to appoint counsel if it's necessary. But many of these situations are people who will be known to the court. Perhaps they're in. You know, the day after, a month after, they've been found unfit uh, for certain reasons, and they have not done what the decision of unfitness says would be necessary in order to regain custody. Uh, that's a situation in which it's going to be fairly clear-cut that we don't have changed circumstances yet that should trigger a re-adjudication of unfitness and of custody. And that changed circumstances showing is not a showing on the merits of unfitness. It's just an initial showing that something has changed so that a whole new process should commence. If a parent happens to be a lawyer, and has had a child taken away and placed under guardianship. Is there any limit on the number of times that parent can petition uh, the court for removal of the guardian? In the probate court proceedings, no, there is not. If DCF is involved well, if you know, in that, If you know how to plead, if you know your way around the court, you can file an unlimited number of removal petitions or challenge every decision that's made. But you, you don't can. get a lawyer every time you do it. Yeah. Yeah, right. unless have there is uh, uh, some sort of rule that something has to have changed since this happened before, which we believe is the Aaron rule, even in the care and protection context for review and I see your time is up, but I have one question. You keep referring to the daily filings and people are known. What are the statistics about filing petitions for removal in the probate and family court? I think the statistic that has been stated, which of course does not incorporate experience post-VV, uh, and I think that's a cautionary note, um, is something like 500. We think we should take a cautionary approach here. We think that uh, you issued a very important decision in February in VV that may have some real ramifications with respect to post-appointment. Obviously, you're now going to have counsel up front. Hopefully, that will cut down on the number of post-appointment uh, issues, disputes, like visitation. What's the number relative to the number of pending guardianships? You, uh, what are the number of removal petitions filed? I, I don't think we have the ability to distinguish necessarily removal petitions from other post-appointment petitions, uh, but my memory is that it's something like a tenth for the category of um, post-appointment versus the original. But again, this is pre-VV. We do ask you in all these respects, um, with respect to all of the issues that are before you, many issues about visitation, other modification, are not before you. Um, you have a very narrow issue with respect to visitation that's before you, which is simply a scenario where a parent um, is seeking to get some change in a court-ordered visitation schedule. That is a very narrow scenario. It does not raise issues about terminating all visitation. Uh, we think the answer to that scenario is exceedingly clear. Um, nobody is trying to take anything away from the parent at all. There's no custody issue, and there's no protected liberty interest can, can, in a particular visitation schedule. Sorry, I just had one more question, and that it, it relates to the children, and I, I know your position that it wasn't raised and you haven't briefed it, but here's just a, it's a practical question. The, the, the particular uh, provision in the uh, code about 
um, if, if, if a child requests, counsel shall be appointed. Can you tell me how that works in operation in this kind of proceeding, how it would work? In, for children, Your Honor, yes. I'm not prepared to address uh, the rights of children. I have no position just, for you on that. I no, would it wasn't say a position. That I just wondered, as a practical matter, if you know anything about how it happens in, well, in probate and family I, court. I, I, I really don't. Um, I know that it's discretionary to some extent um, in that context, um, but how often it happens or uh, under what circumstances it does or does not, I have not looked into that. We have not briefed the issues with respect to the children. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Deborah Kirchway, and I represent the appellee child, GL. Thank you for hearing the children's voice in this important case. Um, my client, as you know, opposes mother having the right to counsel uh, in post-decree proceedings. Um, and both law and policy support her position. Um, the, as the state mentioned, um, the plaintiffs and the, uh, the appellants, I should say, are looking to, they're asking you for more rights than parents in DCF-involved guardianships have now. If you look closely at the statute, 119, section 29, it indicates uh, th three particular sections of the guardianship statute. How is statute. the child's <coughs> interest <coughs> undermined in any way by the parent's right to counsel? Your Honor, I'm representing my client's position, and my, my client does not want her mother to have the right to counsel. But I need to know why. Um, well, you know, the fact is, is um, certainly if, all, if, if everybody gets an attorney, then I can't argue that that's going to harm um, anyone's interests. But, so um, but if, if, the if parents, it doesn't harm your interests, then... Well, if the parents are the only one in the room with an attorney, then I would argue that is clearly in, in the child, not in the child's best interest. Um, and actually, what I would like to do is jump... Um, to the child's right to counsel, if I may, um, since you are considering this important issue of counsel for parents, now is the time to address the issue of an automatic right to counsel for children, because an unrepresented child will never be able to appeal the lack of counsel, so it will never reach this court on its own. Um, providing counsel to a parent, but not the child, does not assure the best outcome. It ensures that the parent's rights and wishes will be promoted. But when you say a, ch a child will never have the right to appeal, you mean as a practical matter? The, yeah, a ch an unrepresented child will never appeal the fact that he or she did not get counsel. Because it, they it just won't happen. Okay. Because they can't? Because they don't know how, they can't. They don't have an attorney that knows that, I mean, they, they have no idea how to do that. So how, how does that support the idea that nobody should have a lawyer after the... Uh, uh, um, well, Your Honor... Um, after the initial petition. My concern uh, is that I am here to sharpen the issues for your consideration. Can I ask and, you on that? Uh, just as a matter of clarity, did, um, does the uh, decision in VV result in judges appointing ch uh, counsel for children in the initial guardianship proceeding? Yes. So children are appointed counsel in the oh, initial. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. There's no, that has not <coughs> affected the appointment of counsel for children. At all? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so um, I think it's important to, in terms of looking at the totality of the circumstances and the, the issues in this case, that the Supreme Court in Lassiter made it very clear that under federal due process, there's no automatic right to counsel even in a termination of parental rights case where the state is involved. Granted, our courts have broadened that protection, and, but Lassiter makes it clear that it's entirely appropriate to look at alternatives to an automatic right to counsel. Um, and I, I pick up on what Your Honor said, that if you build it, they will come. And it's hard to imagine that a right to counsel would lead to fewer removals or fewer motions to modify. And the benevolent, but the admittedly very benevolent impulses that may lean toward broadening the right to counsel are understandable. But this Commonwealth has a balanced budget law. And what is the cost of this going to be? And furthermore, if this is allowed, these same due process arguments 
could very easily be used by parents in divorce cases. Because to a parent, his or her due process interests are exactly the same, whether the party seeking to take custody from him or her is the state, the grandmother seeking guardianship, or their soon-to-be ex-spouse. It's all the same liberty interest. Uh, one, one more piece I'd like to say on the children's right to counsel. Um, children's due process interests in a guardianship case are far greater than those of parents. Parents have a liberty interest in that relationship with the child, and they have an interest in making those decisions for the child. The child has a liberty interest in the relationship with the parent, a liberty interest in the relationship with the guardian, and their what, fit. What's the liberty interest in the relationship with the guardian? Constitutionally well, protected liberty interest? Uh, well, the, there certainly is, there's a movement in that direction. I can't say it's absolutely protected by due process as a matter of law, but certainly with the development of de facto, um, de facto parents, there's a movement in that direction protecting that relationship. Um, but even more so than that, the child has the physical liberty interest of someone is going to be making decisions about where that child eats, sleeps, goes to school, medical care. And so that child has by far the greatest liberty interest of all. And if only one party is to have counsel, it should be the child. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, counsel.